Revelation 17. And there are seven chapters in Revelation to do with the active judgments of God upon evil. They are all expanding the last verse of chapter 14 where the wicked are pictured as being trampled in a wine press outside the city, Jerusalem, the church. That's a pretty terrible sort of picture. But there are seven chapters and the question may come, why so much about Babylon? All of 17? All of 18? Why all this about Babylon? Because the greatest deception is to think that a mere assent to the truth constitutes righteousness. Many shall say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not cast out demons in thy name? And he'll say, I never knew you. The seven chapters on judgment are to save professing Christians from the trap of thinking that a mere profession is the same as possession. It's not. We are not saved by profession of Christ. We are saved by possession of Christ, which means a broken heart and a will to follow him in all things, despite a thousand failures regularly. So the reason for the seven chapters is because religion in all ages has been a protective mantle for people who don't really know God. And millions will be lost who think they're going to be saved. So these chapters are warning. Look at 17 now. <coughs> One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, come I'll show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. Please note, in this verse, it says Babylon sits on many waters, meaning the Euphrates. That was the great river, the greatest river in southwestern Asia. And it was the foundation of commerce for the greatest city, which was Babylon. So Babylon is said here to sit on many waters. Later on in the chapter, it says she's sitting on seven mountains. Now tell me, how do you reconcile that? Millions of Christians who are literalists and who interpret scripture locally, literally and not deeply spiritually have a problem here. How copious would a woman have to be in size to be able to spread over seven mountains and at the same time be seated on many waters? So Revelation chapter 1, right at the beginning of the book, says he sent and signified it, signified it, sent it by signs and symbols. In the end of the first chapter it says the seven stars are, says what they represent. Seven candlesticks are what they represent. When we get to chapter 11 it reminds us, it says which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. In other words, again and again, Revelation reminds us it's a book of symbols, book of pictures. We have to use the Old Testament to unlock them, which we tried to do last hour. <coughs> with her, the kings of the earth committed adultery, happiness of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. In the great prophets of the Old Testament, Isaiah, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, God is forever accusing his people, his loved people, redeemed people, he accuses them of being unfaithful spouse, of being harlot, of having a relationship with the powers of Egypt and Babylon and other powers instead of only with him. You know, in the church of Ephesus, it says in the message to it, you've lost your first love. Well, if a bride loses her love, for a husband, she's lost everything. And here when it pictures Babylon, her sin as that of prostitution, spiritual fornication, it means the church is wedded to the world and to worldly powers. All through the Middle Ages that happened. For about a thousand years, 
The professing Christian church <coughs> depended on government power. <coughs> the great Anglican church into which I was born is a national church. Many wonderful people in it. <coughs> you must never forget in chapter 18 verse 4 God says, Come out of her, my people. God's got lots of people in Babylon. Lots of people. But the sin of bad religion is forsaking dependence on God only. And here again, <coughs> may I remind you of the moral purpose of prophecy. My great sin, your great sin, is to fall away from complete dependence on God. We want to see, we want to feel, we want to hear, we want to have tangible evidence that things are going our way. To live by faith alone, in the words of scripture, is a fight of faith. And sometimes when you or I are on the verge of death and the doctors have told us we're in a bad shape, we learn that lesson, that God is our only strength. But if continually we are looking for strength outside of God, God calls that prostitution. The whole of this chapter, like the one that follows, is about bad religion. And bad religion is that religion that has forsaken the gospel using worldly methods and depending on worldly power. Verse 3, The angel carried me away in the spirit into a desert. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. So here's a woman who's not only on seven mountains, she's not only on many waters, now she's saddled to a beast. So it's clearly a picture, right? Beasts represent governments. <coughs> the woman was dressed in purple and scarlet. They're the colours of the materials for the veil of the temple. This woman claims to be administering the temple of God. She's glistening with gold, precious stones and pearls. So did the temple. And yet she's filled with abominable things. And this title was written on her forehead and mystery is not part of the title, though NIV has made it so separate. Remember the Bible talks about the mystery of godliness and the mystery of iniquity. And it's saying here is the mystery of iniquity. Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. Here it is suggesting that bad religion spawns so much else that is evil. Jill and I have met some very nice neighbours whom we joke with and talk with and in our early experience they said to us, we've had so many bad experiences with Christians. And you remember that Mahatma Gandhi, when he was asked why he's not a Christian, he said one word, Christians. Nietzsche, the most influential philosopher of the 19th century, he said, when you show me you're redeemed, I'll believe in your Christ. Isn't that sad? That there's so much profession rather than possession of Christ that we fail to win the world. And that's what this is talking about. I saw the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints. Now that's pretty tough, isn't it? You remember at the end of that great denunciation, Matthew 23, where you have eight woes on the Pharisees. He accuses Jerusalem as being the murderer of saints and prophets. Well, this is saying the same thing. Drunk with the blood of the saints. <coughs> Let me read you something terrible if I can locate it. This is from a historian by the name of Dr. John Lord who wrote about 13 books called Beacon Lights of History. This is what he said about the Christian church, church I belong to, church you belong to. What crimes and abominations have not been committed in the name of the church? If we go back and accept the history of the Dark Ages, what wars has not this church encouraged? What discords has she not incited? 
What superstitions has she not endorsed? What pride has she not arrogated? What cruelties has she not inflicted? What countries has she not robbed? What hardships has she not imposed? What deceptions has she not used? What avenues of thought has she not guarded with a flaming sword? What truth has she not perverted? What goodness has she not mocked and persecuted? Interrogate the Albigenses, the Waldenses, the shades of Jerome of Prague, of Huss, Savonarola, Cranmer. Interrogate the martyrs of 30 years' war, those who died in the dragon aids of Louis XIV, those who fell by the hand of Charles IX. Go to Smithfield, Paris on St. Bartholomew. 70,000 Protestants were slaughtered in the massacre of St. Bartholomew. They'd come for a wedding between a Catholic and a Protestant. And when the bell went in the great cathedral, they were massacred by the thousands and then in the other cities of France. Don't blame Roman Catholicism for this. Roman Catholic human nature is no worse than Protestant human nature and no better. It should be remembered that Protestants too have persecuted. Why is there a part of America called Maryland? Because that was the only place that was safe for Catholics for many years in the new country. Protestants persecuted. So I am to see my nature and yours in its terrible potential. May I remind you, given the right circumstances, any one of us is capable of any sin. Again, I say, you won't believe that until you get in certain circumstances. But human nature without Christ is devilish. It is murderous. Well, I could read much more, but <coughs> that illustrates what Revelation 17 means when it says it's drunk with the blood of the saints. That's the Christian church. Professes Christ and kills Let's see what follows. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. You remember Christ was astonished at the unbelief of his own people at Nazareth. The angel said, why are you astonished? I'll explain it to you. <coughs> the beast you saw, worldly government, once was, now is not, will come up out of the abyss and go to his destruction. Here it's thinking about the impact of Calvary on Satan. For a time he is not, but he revives to persecute. And all of these seven heads of the beast have a time when they are not, and then another head takes over and it is. The beast that was, is not, and will come up out of the abyss. That's the story of evil right through the millenniums. Pomp and glory, persecutes, trouble, is not. Revives, persecutes, goes through the same cycle. The inhabitants of the earth whose names has not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world will be astonished when they see the beast because he once was, now is not, yet will come. In other words, this book is saying the worst persecution of government is yet to come. This calls for mind with wisdom, the seven heads, the seven hills. The better word is mountains. The Greek word more often means mountains. You know, many people want to apply this verse to Rome. Well, Jill and I have been in Rome, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't notice the, the hills very easily. I've been there twice and I've never even noticed them but then I'm not very observant. But if they were mountains, I would have noticed them. They aren't mountains. <laughs> seven hills are seven mountains. See, a mountain is used in the Bible as a symbol of a kingdom, not a hill. And these seven heads are symbolic of kings. They're also seven kings. In the book of Daniel, kings and kingdom are used interchangeably. So it's talking about the whole range of persecuting kingdoms. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome pagan, so on, Rome papal. Five have fallen, one is Rome, the other has not yet come, final Antichrist. When he does come, he must remain for a little while. 
the beast who once was, now is not an eighth king. He belongs to seven. How can he belong to seven be an eighth king? Eight is the number for resurrection. Remember the name Jesus in Greek, the letters stand for numbers, amounts to eight, eight, eight. All the titles for Christ in the New Testament are multiples of eight. Eight's the number of resurrection. So when Antichrist comes up for the last time, that's his last resurrection. Ten horns are ten kings or kingdoms not yet received a kingdom for one hour or receive authority as kings along with the beast. The seventh head has ten horns. The kingdoms of earth will all be with Antichrist to persecute the people of God and establish their own type of religion. They'll make war against the Lamb. Now again, may I apply this morally. When you and I act otherwise than Jesus would act, we are making war with the Lamb. And how often I've done it. Remember, all prophecy has a moral purpose. Nothing in prophecy is only about the future. Everything in Scripture has meaning for now. Remember, Christ said to Paul, before he was Paul, when he was Saul, 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 why persecutest thou me? The man who became Paul the Apostle is said to be a persecutor of Christ because he's hurting his people. You know, if we could lift the roofs of the millions of homes in the cities of Australia, in so many of them, we would see women who are haggard and drawn, children who are soured with life, and men intent on getting their own way, who are nasty and devilish, it is very commonplace in homes that don't know Christ. But wherever a spirit is manifested, in a home, in a church, in a business, with neighbours, wherever a spirit is manifested that doesn't reflect Christ, that spirit is making war on him. We must never lose sight of the moral impact of these prophecies. I can make war on Christ today by speaking in a way that does not represent him, by acting in a way that does not represent him, by failing to love people for whom he died. But in the end it'll be a very literal thing in the world where the governments of earth will make war with the Lamb. Notice it says in the next verse, he's Lord of Lords, King of Kings, with him will be his call, chosen and faithful followers. Note the three of them. It's not enough to be called. Many are called, but what? Few are chosen. Gideon called together 32,000. How many became his ultimate soldiers? 300. Many are called, but few are chosen. It's very easy to accept a call with part of our oneself, not being wholly committed. So there are people who are enrolled and then there are the picked men of God, the chosen, because they're faithful, full of faith, full of faith. <coughs> the angel said the waters are the peoples, multitudes, nations and tongues. The beasts and ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They'll bring her to ruin. Remember, in the previous chapter, the waters are dried up. So here it uses the symbolism that the ten mini-kingdoms in the Antichrist world will ultimately turn on bad religion and burn her. Next chapter will talk about the burning. Whenever a priest's daughter played the harlot, she was not stoned. She was burnt. So Babylon here, claiming to be a priest of God, representative of God, is to be burnt. Recall, please, what happened in AD 70. If we went back 40 years, the number of testing, the Jews are one with Rome to destroy Christ. But after 40 years, the Romans destroy the Jews. So here it is saying to be the same at the end of the world. Powers at first oppose the church, as the Jews and Romans oppose Christ, will ultimately fight each other. And that's how the waters are dried up. Again and again in scripture, we find the enemies of the church turn on each other and destroy each other. 
So this is the same as the drying up of the river Euphrates when the Ten Kingdoms turn on bad religion and make war against it. God has put into their hearts to accomplish his purpose by agreeing to give the beasts their power to rule until God's word to fulfil the woman you saw as that great city rules over the kings of the earth. The expression the great city is first found in Revelation 11 and verse 8 and it's applied to Jerusalem. But apostate Jerusalem. Fifteen times in Revelation Babylon is called great. But remember in the Old Testament prophecies Jeremiah takes up a big boulder, throws it into the river, says, thus shall Babylon be destroyed. Other symbolism, a mountain collapses into the water. God's predictions for bad religion are very terrible ones. In order that I may not make a mistake of joining it. Terrible thing to make Babylon a denomination or to make her opposite number, the pure woman, a denomination. New Testament knows nothing about denominations. We'll just take a minute or two on chapter 18. <clears throat> After this I saw another angel coming down from heaven with great authority. Earth was illuminated by his splendour. The mighty voice he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the, Babylon the great. She's become a home for demons, a haunt for every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean, detestable bird. But then in verse 4, another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so you will not share in her sins, so you'll not receive any of her plagues. All seven plagues are Babylon's plagues. They've got nothing to do with the Middle East. They have to do with a worldwide apostate religion linked with a worldwide apostate government. First verse says, the earth to be illuminated with the glory of God. That's the last gospel message. And part of that gospel message is, come out of Babylon, which is not a call to come out of any particular denomination. Because there are Babylonian elements in all denominations. And we must do our best, try and represent the true church of God, and not to follow along with things like hierarchies and traditions. They're the things that belong to Babylon. The greatest heresy of the church in the Middle Ages was that she had power to denominate what was heresy and to persecute. And so according to some historians, 50 million died because of that. I don't think the number was that great, but it was a terrible number. But here's the greatest heresy of the church, the power to denominate what is heresy and to punish it. So part of Babylon is when it doesn't act as Christ would act. Part of Babylon is hierarchical structures. Part of Babylon is clinging to traditions instead of Holy Scripture. But the invitation of God is, come out of her, my people. So God has people everywhere, however bad a situation may look. And he's asking them to separate from anything that looks like Babylon. So what sort of a picture of God do we get? A God who's very just, but a God who wants to save all who are willing to be saved. All who are willing to respond, to leave all known evil and associate with all known good. They're his people and the seven last plagues are not for them. Everlasting glory is for them. Let's pray. Thank you for scripture. Help us to understand it. Help us see its moral significance for us today, where we live in our situation, that we may not be afraid of tumultuous waters of trouble. We may look to the Lamb of God and follow him whithersoever he goeth. Make it so for all of us, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. We'll probably only have one or two more meetings on Revelation and then in case someone's here that wasn't here when I talked about this before, we, Lord willing, have a series that follow. Some would call it biblical theology, but it's really about what the Bible teaches about God, man and living.
very practical theories, how to deal with the problems of life, how to survive in the stresses of life. But in order to do that, we have to know what God is like. Otherwise, I won't trust his patience, won't trust his love. And I'll need to know the truth about myself. And the last verse is Romans 7, give a terrible picture of the greatest Christian of the first century after Christ, Paul. We need to understand what that's about. Only when we know the truth about God and about man do we know how to handle life. It won't be a handling without mistakes, it won't be a handling without failures, but it'll be a handling that will result in glory. So that, Lord willing, that's what we'll be moving into, biblical theology, God, man, how to live.